Hello everyone. Welcome to KGB Bible Stories. Today on this beautiful Sabbath day we have a continuation for our Sabbath school reading material which comes from the book The Law of Life by E.J. Wagner. We've been enjoying this book for some weeks now and every every chapter even we parted in different sections because uh, we can only record 20 minutes at a time. And so we invite you guys to check out the rest of the videos and learn from what God bless E.J. Wagner. Let us start with a word of prayer. Today we're starting with the seventh commandment. We're on page 87. And so let's go ahead and uh, bow our hands to a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, be with us in this time. Bless those who are hearers and doers of thy word. Bless us and give us words to speak. The, a word in due season for those needed. In Jesus' holy name, amen. And we're going over the seventh commandment, which can be found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. And it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And this is one of the many of the commandments right now that even at the end of this world is very not well understood. It even wasn't understood back in the days of ancient Israel. And uh, what does it mean? That What is adultery? And everything. Because right now we're in a world where divorce is very common. And, uh, and you see that happening right now. Most everyone, when they, things don't work out, they want to get they want to get divorced and everything. But we're going to look at is the God the author of divorce, or is Satan the author of divorce? Now, before we begin reading this book, I want to read a famous quote from the Bible, and everything is found in Matthew chapter twenty-four, and we all know this one. <clears throat> and now we want to understand. It says, but as in the days of Noah, or Noah, mm -hmm. where shall also the coming of the Son of Man be? So it says, as in the days of Noah shall, shall be the coming of the Son of Man. As it were in the days there before the flood, they were eating and drinking, and they were marrying and given in marriage, in marriage mm -hmm. until the day that Noah entered the ark. And if you understand right now, it says they were marrying means they were married, and while they were marrying, they were giving in marriage. Which means while they were still married, they were, they were marrying once again, while they were still married to them. And now if anybody is a married couple, if you even though even back in the days, I'm not sure if modern day marriages even want to do this anymore, which marriage comes from God, they were saying until marriage is until death, for richer or poorer, for sickness or health, until death do you part? Now those words are not idle. That comes from that definitely comes from the Bible and everything. So marriage, we'll, we're going to show that marriage is until death do you part. That, the, that the divorce is from ultimately from Satan himself. God is not the author of divorce. And you will see that even in the Bible and everything, when the divorce was given, it was given it was given by Moses, not God to the nation, even the nation of Israel, because why? The nation of Israel had a very big problem with, e with even marriage and everything, and how they treated women and everything. So God, so out of the hardness of the nation of Israel's heart, Moses had to give them divorce of institution that was not godly, and the Bible shows us. <coughs> now, I want to, now I would like the wife to continue on the book and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin reading the book and everything. It says, <clears throat> We come now to the seventh commandment before entering into the minute consideration of it. We will be worth a while to consider its place among the ten. <clears throat> the order of the commandments. Did you ever occur to the reader that the order of the commandments is not accidental? It is certainly cannot be. And there must surely be a lesson for us in their arrangement. We may now know all that there is in it, but we will certainly repay study. The first reveals God as his essential attributes as a savior. This is Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage, and you shall have no other gods before me. 
and he is the only he is the only God because he's the only one who can what who can save mm -hmm. so there's, there there people have many gods out there you know in history there's been so many gods but there's only one God that can save us to the utmost amen he is the creator in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 11 it says I even I am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior Amen. And who is that Savior? Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's Jesus Christ and everything. And uh, Jesus Christ will, will save us and everything. Because we, we have an advocate with the Father and we have who? Jesus Christ the righteous. All right, there we go. Jesus Christ the righteous and everything. He is to plead our cause before who? The Father. Because who what law? Because what law? Because right now we're reading about the law. Which law did we ultimately break? The Ten Commandments law. It, it, we broke the Father's law. Exactly. As it was given by Jesus. Jesus gave the law and everything, but we broke we broke the Father's law. <clears throat> That's correct. And, and and continue on, it says the second naturally grows out of for this. And Isaiah chapter forty five verse twenty says, There have no knowledge that set up the word of their idols and pray unto pray unto God that cannot save. See right now, so we're not to pray to a God that cannot even save now. So we should only be worshiping one God in heaven. And not do like the heathens do. Then we have in the third an assurance and the power of the name of God. We are not to bow down to graven images which are nothing or to take his name. And we have <clears throat> and we have assured that we shall not take that for nothing or in vain. It applies all it that he himself is. <clears throat> So we're not. So right now, what's the commandments going on? We're to worship the only one true God, the one God that can save. We're not to take His name in vain. When Psalm seventy-five, verse one: For Thy His name is near; His wondrous works declare. All the works of God declare. It says, and I think it's Psalms nineteen: The heavens declare the glory of God. When you look at the heavens, it cannot be evolution because there is design in every creation. It's not spontaneous. It's everything is in order from the cell to the ocean. Everything's in order. So we have a God who made these things and people lack faith to believe that and they just believe on false theories, which is not faith. <coughs> I'm going to continue reading in page 88. It shows the Lord at work and at rest. And when we see his works understandingly, we learn his ways and enter into his rest. From the contemplation of God as creator, we are next brought to consider him as father. He is the universal father in human parenthood, is the revelation of God working through the flesh. From the honor due to our parents, we are to learn the reverence to learn to reverence, reverence due to God. We are to learn the reverence due to God, the Supreme Father of all. As the life transmitted from the Father to Son is God's life, the sixth commandment is the sign to guard its sacredness. Then we come to the seventh commandment, which also emphasizes the sacredness of life in showing that it must be kept pure and unadulterated. God's life is simplicity itself. His is seen in the most common things by which He conveys life to us. As the air and water, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The sin of Eve was the first case of adultery. And all the specific facts, acts of adultery since that time had been but outgrowth from that. She left that simple for the complex, the straight way of righteousness and life for the maze of sin and death. And if you look at, if you look at this one right now, you look at Romans chapter seven and everything. It's a story. It's the, it's the story of marriage to represent even the case of sin. It says, 
In right Galatians now. 4, right? No, yeah, Romans chapter 7. Oh, okay. It uses, a, it uses a story of marriage as a base to the law of God and sin and everything. It says, basically with the law and everything, you cannot, you, when, you're, when we're born, we're married to who? To Christ. No, we're not married to Christ when we're born. Oh, pardon me. I'm, we're married to the devil. We're married to the devil because we're all what? We're all under sin. We're all been, we all have the sinful nature and everything. And it says we must die to what? Our old self must die, or we must die in order, to, or our old spouse must die in order to be what? Married to Christ. And everything. So that's why he said you must be dead to what? Sin. That's what I was saying. Eve, Eve, what, Eve, when she was in, when she's in the Garden of Eden, she was what? She was sinless. But when she sinned, she did what? She she married she married that sin, and what ended up happening is she had to die to sin in order to be what? Married to Christ, married to Christ, and everything. So that that's why they use the term marriage right now. And we're gonna get to Romans chapter seven what this deals with. Yeah, uh, that also reminded me of Galatians chapter four. I think it's Galatians four where it says that we can either be the uh, from the seed of Hagar or the seed of Sarah. Mm -hmm. Which Hagar represents bondage because mm -hmm. she was a bond servant, mm -hmm. and Sarah was a free woman. We can be free in Christ if we choose Christ. Well, that's Galatians chapter four, around verse twenty-six, oh, there and you are, yeah. that's another story of marriage right now. Because when Mar when Ab it, it's when that story of marriage and everything, when you deal with Hagar and even Sarah, Sarai, remember God promised what Abraham, you're going to have a child that's going to be the seed promised. But the seed is going to come from. It's ultimately seed is Christ, but through Isaac, he was going to, pick. he was going to bless the, the he's going to bless the nations and everything. And what did Abraham do? He took on an extra what? A wife. I'm about to read it. Mm -hmm. All right. Galatians chapter mm -hmm. four, verse twenty two. It says, "For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, which is Hagar, the other by a free woman." But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman by was by a promise. Verse 24. I read 23 prior. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. The one from Mount Sinai, comma, which gendered to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Agar, which is Mount Sinai in Arabia, answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. For Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Mm -hmm. Let us continue with the reading. And before we continue, okay. and, and when you look about the story of Abraham and everything, Abraham was given the what? The promise. There is, there's going to be a son Isaac, but what did he do? By not having faith, he tried, or oh, him and his wife did what? Try to go against God, try to go ahead of God and, and what? Try to fulfill that promise. And what did he end up doing? Who was his wife? It was Sarah. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be until death do you part. Exactly. What, did, what, did, what, did, what did Sarah do? Or would it be Sarai that turned into Sarah and everything? She did what? She said, take on my handmaiden, come in unto her, and they ended up having a son named Ishmael. And what that ended up happening to do, so what he did was he broke the seventh commandment to do what? Have In order to one. have a son because they didn't understand God's plan. Yes. And if you look they at, try to do it by their own works, right? Yeah, they do it by their own works. And he ended up having, have, and when he had an ex having an extra wife, taking on an extra wife and everything, what ended up doing? He had a lot of extra marital problems and everything. But what ended up happening afterwards? Ultimately, Sarah said she has to go. And what did God do to Abraham? Listen to your wife. She must go. Mm -hmm. And everything. So basically, they, he, even though he broke the seventh commandment and everything, he had to do what? Correct himself and everything. And, he, and Hagar and Ishmael went away, which means he was no longer, he was no longer breaking the letter of law, the seventh commandment. And if you look at even Abraham and everything, he, began, they, he had a happier life after that and everything. And, what, and what, look what his son um, Isaac, Isaac in the Bible, which is one of the example of marriages, he did what? He had, a, he had a wife of his own, of God's own choosing. He married Rebecca, and the Bible never records him marrying anybody else. And everything. And he said, and he said he lived all happy all the days of his life with what? 
One wife. One wife. And but the happiness was not his wife. The happiness was in the mm -hmm. Lord and obeying his commandments. Yes, but also, too, the happiness was in his wife, too, because guess what? Exactly, yes, too. When, he, when Abraham sent his what? His servant. God chose who he was going to marry. Exactly. So ultimately, it was it was the wife that God chose for him. Exactly. Rebecca wasn't. It's going to get in here. Is who do you choose? Who, who arranges the marriage? It should be God. But what I try to say is that the main happiness mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um, Isaac was not his wife, mm -hmm. but was his relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And from that relationship, God blessed him with a wife. Yes. Let us continue. Page 88, the beginning of evil. It is not necessary for us to dwell upon the grosser forms of the violation of this commandment. They are generally regarded not only as a sin, but as crimes, as offenses against respectability. You know, this makes me think of a verse that says, He that commits adultery sinneth against his own soul. Something like that. I remember that verse. Uh, yes, I recollect it. I don't know exactly where it's found. Page 89. Whether the gross violation of this commandment is worse than the violation of other commandments, God alone knows. But one thing is sure, and that is that the commandment is exceeding broad. People generally regard it as prohibiting the culmination, culmination of sin, whereas it deals specially with the beginning of it. Christ's words is a sermon on the mount show the spirituality of the commandment. Matthew 5, 27, 28. Would you like to read those verses, please? It says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27, it says, We have heard that it is said, uh, then by old time, you should not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, have committed adultery in his heart. <coughs> Mm -hmm. um, so it's very clear and remember it said the law is broad there's many ways to even break it this is the spirituality of it which means many people that are married and uh, and, they, and here's the thing we don't really understand let's say a single person looks upon what? a woman another man's or a man another man's wife or anything vice versa or vice versa and everything looks upon them and says oh they're very looks upon them with even lust in their heart which means that is committed adultery because that's somebody else's wife. That's adultery. And, and if a married couple and everything looks upon somebody else while they're married and everything, it's what? It adultery. is committed adultery. Two single persons could look upon each other, but they should look upon each other in a righteous way. <clears throat> that is not adultery and everything. So when you're married, you're, you're supposed to keep your mind singly into the one you're married to. Mm -hmm. And don't covet somebody... And, one that is at the uh, 10th commandment, don't come with someone else's wife. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and something interesting here in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 5, it says, <clears throat> hath, hath committed adultery already with her in his, with his hands? No, right? It doesn't say that. It says, with his heart. Starts with the thoughts. Christ has not adding anything to the commandment which he himself has given. He has revealed the breadth and depth of it. His language is unqualified and unlimited. The commandment is violated by an impure thought or look, not simply upon a woman who is not one's wife, but upon any woman whatsoever. The lustful thought is adultery. Mm -hmm. For the commandment is magnified by Christ's statement of it. We see that adultery may exist even within the marriage relation, for that relation does not sanctify lustful thought and impure action. The institution of marriage, God himself instituted marriage in the beginning, and as a matter of fact, there's many Adventists, many, that do not understand this topic, including that they don't even understand that marriage is an institute. How could you do away with a marriage institute? Marriage is an institute as, as far also, it's a twin institute with the seven-day Sabbath. If the Sabbath cannot be abolished, why is marriage going to be abolished? Now, now this gentleman, E.J. Wagner, when he did one of the verses in Matthew 25, he was dealing with the spirituality of the law, right? Matthew there. 25. Matthew, no, Matthew 5 and everything. 
Now, the Sermon on the Mount, if anyone understands the Sermon on the Mount, it had a twofold reason to it. <clears throat> and uh, one of the reasons was, it was basically to show to the Jews, more specifically because of the book, the book